this man's life has lost its zest. For him, the kick's gone out of living. thing like this to anybody I liked, but a guy like you, well, who cares? So here's the deal. Hey, Dad, you know that place down by the creek? Hush, honey. That call, what does Ralph want? Oh, he has some kind of a harebrained scheme up his sleeve. He'll be by tonight. Thank you. Ralph always manages to get you all upset. Bored stiff, you mean. And that's another thing. I've made an appointment. 1.30. Dr. Bogart. Why, though, I'll never know. Because it just isn't natural the way you've been driving around this way. After all, everybody should have something to be interested in. Doesn't bother me any. Well, it does me. I think there's something wrong with your thyroid or something. Like Fred. Well, that's the story on you. No interest at home or at the office either. Even when his boss leans on him, he rolls with the punch. Why get in a sweat over a lot of busy work? Same way with friends. Don Finney likes to talk hobbies. Hugh couldn't care less. His appointment with Dr. Bogart gives him a good excuse to leave. Physically, Hugh's okay, the doctor reports. No thyroid deficiency to slow him down. But has he been shortchanging himself on sleep? Is he depressed about anything? Has trouble developed at work or at home? The answer's no. The verdict? Boredom. Dr. Bogart's advice is for Hugh to find some all-consuming interest in life. What kind of nonsense is that? Hugh Flat can't do it. Hugh's condition may be serious. He'd better check with Dr. Jeffers over in the medical center. Not a psychiatrist. Yes, a psychiatrist. Boredom's an emotional state. Out of hand, it calls for specialized treatment. Well, maybe only... Well, why make a federal case out of it? After all, what difference does it make if a man's bored? What harm can it do? Ed Vance, Hugh's boss, could answer those questions. For instance, he'd like to put Hugh in charge of the new branch office. But a job like that calls for enthusiasm and drive. Ed's afraid that Hugh just wouldn't spark the team. The Country Club Executive Committee. Hugh's nominated... But Don Finney says no. That committee job's not the place for a wet blanket. At home, too, Hugh's boredom exacts a price. In terms of his relations with Loretta, for example. By nature, Loretta's an enthusiastic person. But no enthusiasm can hold up long under Hugh's boredom. so many times. It all creates conflict in Loretta. Sometimes, subconsciously, she strikes out. But mostly, she, she herself loses interest and enthusiasm. It's as if Hugh's boredom were contagious, as if Loretta had somehow contracted it like a virus. For Kenny, the situation's even worse. Hugh has no time for the boy's enthusiasm. How 
long will Kenny be able to stay interested himself? Already the contagion of boredom is affecting his schoolwork. Disciplinary problems are beginning to develop also, problems that tie in closely with Kenny's boredom. The presents don't help. Neither does punishment. Ken's grades keep going down. What to do about it? What not to do comes easier. It's like with Ann Galloway down the block. She's bored, so she drinks. More and more and more she drinks. Sam Haglin across the street has a private remedy for boredom, too. He makes friends with every $10 tramp who comes along. Young Link Nagel down at the filling station gets his kicks racing the cops. Trouble is, that kind of business can get you into some pretty messy situations. And more important, it doesn't really solve the problem of boredom at all. You forget your frustrations for a moment, sure, but there's no real satisfaction. Excitement gets to be like Ann Galloway's whiskey. The kick wears off. Why do bored people do such things? Anne claims it's the monotony of housework that gets her down. She dealt satisfactorily with monotony when she had a job, though, back before she was married. Actually, her real trouble isn't monotony. It's that she grew up feeling that being a woman, a housewife, is an empty, meaningless, thankless task. Her job, on the other hand, was exciting and meaningful. But Anne's husband won't hear of her working now. The result? Inner conflict for Anne. Conflict between the demands of marriage and her personal hunger for a feeling of self-worth. Her boredom, her drinking, they're the symptoms of that conflict. Sam Haglin claims his trouble is his wife's stupidity. It bores him to distraction. But really, though, his big problem is Woodhall's, his competition across the street. So again, the issue's conflict. Reality versus Sam's picture of himself as worthy of success. But it's a conflict that Sam can't bring himself to acknowledge. The end result, boredom. But it's boredom for which he's found a remedy of sorts. A boost for his ego in a pattern of behavior that dates clear back to his teens. Sam couldn't compete then, either. But there generally seemed to be some girl around to take the sting out of defeat. Link Nagel? He breaks the monotony of slum life by shooting craps. Though he doesn't know it, the roots of his boredom lie deep in hatred of authority. And yet self-preservation demands that he hold his rage under control. Hence, conflict. Hence, boredom. Where does Hugh fit into this conflict-boredom sequence? How did he develop his present pattern? The answer to those questions goes back a lot of years. When Hugh was a baby, he acted spontaneously, did just what he felt like without restriction. And then his mother began to interfere with input and outgo, telling him when to go to sleep, when to wake up, enraging him, soothing him. He learned that sidewalks are hard, stoves are hot, and even little girls can bite. Cleanliness became a virtue, so did green beans. 
and obedience to orders. He learned that his mother could be shocked, shocked, shocked. And by the time he reached school age, he stammered just a little. Other kids laughed. He tried to pretend that he didn't care. He worked harder and harder in school so that he could show them that he was just as good as they were. Arithmetic seemed to come easiest for him. Later, algebra was a cinch. In geometry, he got straight A's. Not that that helped much on the dance floor. Mostly, he still spent his spare time alone. Hugh's father was his best friend. He taught him all about tools, about machinery, about hunting about people, especially that people with white shirts have money and people with blue shirts don't. Hugh's father hated the white shirts' prosperity. They'd created nothing, and yet workers still couldn't meet their bills. To Hugh's mother, the creation part didn't matter. To her, it was money that was important. Hugh could see her side when the time came to meet his father's funeral expenses. Loneliness was even worse. But Hugh went on, though, through college, then into engineering. It was a good life out in the field, working and building the way his dad had always said he should. And then he met a girl, the girl. Only it turned out that Loretta didn't like the kind of life a construction tramp leads. When Hugh got the chance for an office job, he grabbed it. But then Loretta began to object to other things. She didn't like Hugh's friends. She didn't like his crudities. His fussing with mechanical gadgets. If Hugh put up a fight, well, there were always those headaches she had. It always seemed to come at bedtime. Not that Hugh struggled very hard. His mother had trained him too well for that. The higher Hugh rises in the firm, the more he rebels, subconsciously, against the white-shirted public relations frame of mind demanded of him. Yet his family and his financial problems tie him closer and closer to his job. It's a conflict situation. Instead of acknowledging how he feels, he hides his anger behind a bland mask of false cordiality, public relations. The people that Loretta forces him to meet socially are dull and boring. He's cut off from the field projects he loves. And in the cause of clean hands, Loretta has ruled his workshop out of bounds. His relationships with Loretta have deteriorated badly. Night after night, it's the same. Too torn by internal conflict to fight, he sees himself through the eyes of his mother and Loretta. Instead of looking to his own desires, he takes it for granted his main goal in life should be to meet standards set by his wife. With mounting tension comes boredom, a symptom of that conflict between the life that Hugh leads and his basic emotional needs. In effect, boredom says, I want to do something, but I don't even dare admit it. So instead of bringing it out into the open, I'll let my attention wander. I'll develop what looks like fatigue, a supreme disinterest in what I'm supposed to do. In Hugh's case, the situation has been getting worse for years. And by now, it's dubious that he can deal with it effectively without outside help. What might he do about it? Well, he could find at least part of the answer right out in his own backyard, watching son Kenny. Ken's eager to build a tool shed, but sometimes he gets tired of it. Football offers a change of pace. Swimming, too. Bike riding. 
In other words, there's variety in Ken's interests, and change itself is a remedy for mild degrees of boredom, as well as a universal human need. If you do enough different things, there will be little chance to grow bored with any one of them. Ed Vance is another one who could teach you ways to deal with boredom. Because Ed's so taken up with striving to outdo the competition that he's hardly aware of all the busy work he has to handle. His drive to win shapes his whole way of living. He makes no pretense that it doesn't. Whether he's hiring a rival's key man or just playing poker at home on Saturday night. To fight boredom, then, each of us needs to take a cold, clear look at the rules he lives by. For only thus can we resolve our conflicts. We must face our drives with utter honesty, release our tensions, satisfy our inner needs. A case in point, Don Finney has a need to dominate. People who needle you can't always be controlled. Don knows that, too. So he takes out his frustrations on wood. Something that he can shape at will. Something that can't fight back. But a man's patterns are already formed. The best place to stop boredom is back in childhood, before it even starts. Interest is such a fragile thing. It dies so easily. Hugh senses that sometimes, like today. That nail that Ken bent, it brought back so many things. The day so long ago when Hugh's father showed him how to use a block to pull a nail. We help ourselves by helping others, even more when we help our children. If Hugh realized that fact emotionally, his boredom could die right here in this backyard with Kenny. But the moment passed. Hugh's pattern of conflict and of boredom was too rigid, too strong for him to break. Another crisis came that night when Ralph Collier followed up his morning phone call. Well, there it is, boy. Biggest contract our outfit's ever landed. But where do I fit in? Are you kidding? job like this requires a real field man. Well, I came to the best I know. Ralph, do you mean... Do you mean you put me in charge of this whole job? What else? Boy. For two cents, I'd do it, Ralph. This is this is a project, fella. We're Hugh, ready. please. You're not a child anymore. You have a family to think about. She's right, Ralph. You, boy, you don't know what you're saying. Why, this is the greatest challenge you've ever been offered. No go, Ralph. No go. Are you really serious? Serious, Ralph. Just chalk it up to my point. Don't bother you. I'll let myself out. Ralph, perhaps we could discuss this. Sorry, I wasted your time. Oh, Hugh, I'm so glad you didn't let him talk you into that awful job. I mean, being left here all the time with Kenny, I... Oh, dear, there are lots more things than being a little bored. Sure, honey, sure. The day is ended. A day to plunge you even deeper into boredom. And yet there still is hope for him, for out of the day's events, a dim awareness is growing in him, a vague realization that perhaps the road he's on isn't quite the one he wants to travel. Though alone, he's no longer capable of decisive action. He still can win if he'll get proper help. All it demands of him is the first step. 
Can he bring himself to seek that help? Does he have the strength and the courage to break down the walls of fear that pen him in? Or is it too late? So late that he'll live out his years in futility and frustration. Another good man fallen prey to the creeping paralysis of boredom, tasting for himself the bitter gall of conflicts unresolved, potential unfulfilled. It depends on him, him alone. Unless he finds help soon, not just this day, but life itself is ended for him. Ended in another bleak, needless tragedy of boredom at work.